Okay, now that we've looked at end behavior and some of the um, power functions, we're going to look at other aspects of a polynomial, particularly here the zeros of a polynomial. Let's define what that means. So the zeros of a polynomial function, or of any function for that matter, are all the values of x that make the function zero. Okay, that's why they're called zeros. Um, now, if you think about that, if you had a polynomial function, let's even just take a linear polynomial like 2x minus 6. That's a first degree polynomial. If you wanted to find the zeros of that polynomial, you make the function zero. Well, you plug in a zero for, a, uh, for y, the function value, and solve for x, right? So I'd add the 6 and divide out the 2 and to get a value of 3, all right? Now remember, it, this makes 3 the zero of the polynomial, but it also technically is the x-intercept because it corresponds to the point on the graph 3 comma 0, right? So the zeros correspond to the x-intercepts on the graph. Now that's generally speaking true, however there are exceptions to that. Um, there are times where complex numbers can be zeros of a polynomial because you could plug a, po a complex number in and get out a zero. However, we don't consider those x-intercepts because you can't plot them on a graph. Okay, so zeros, this definition is a little bit more broad than just an x-intercept uh, because of the potential for complex numbers. However, we're not going to really deal with complex numbers here. Um, and so generally speaking, we're going to we're going to talk about the real zeros. The real zeros of a polynomial are always x-intercepts. Okay. So the real zeros, and when I say real, I mean the real number, the real number system. So the real zeros are x-intercepts. They're always x-intercepts, okay? Um, now, if I were to take a quadratic polynomial, let's say f of x equals, you know, x squared minus 5x minus 14, for instance. This is a quadratic polynomial. It also has zeros. Again, they could be complex. They could be real. Um, and to find them, you just set the output equal to 0 and solve for x. Now, the problem with a quadratic uh, polynomial or quadratic equation is that you can't just really straightforward um, solve for x here because of the x squared. You have to use a different technique. Um, and there are many techniques. We've seen the quadratic function before. Um, but in our study of polynomials, it's going to be very important to be able to factor to solve uh, and utilize something called the zero factor property, okay? Or zero product principle. It's named different things. Uh, let me just double check. It's on our property index. Zero factor property. There it is. Okay, zero factor property. And so the zero factor property basically says if you have two things multiplied together, let me go ahead and move this up here. If you have two things multiplied together, A and B, and their product is zero, then at least one of those two things has to be zero. Either A is zero, B is zero, or both. Okay? You can't possibly have a product equaling zero where neither of the factors was zero to begin with. That's impossible. So that property uh, tells us if we were to factor this polynomial, we set each factor equal to zero and solve it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is find factors of that polynomial. To do that, whenever the leading coefficient is 1, I can find factors of negative 14 that add up to negative 5 and use those as my factors. So numbers that multiply to negative 14, well, there's a whole list of them. But the ones I want will also add up to negative 5. If you think about those factors, 
7 and 2 will work as long as the 7 is negative, right? So x minus 7 and x plus 2. A negative 7 and a positive 2 combine when you multiply them to get negative 14. And when you add them, they get negative 5. So when we factor, um, we're looking for, as long as the leading coefficient is 1, we're looking for two numbers here whose product is the constant and whose sum is in the middle. Okay. Then from there, we can set each factor equal to 0. Because in order for their product to be 0, at least one of them individually has to be 0. All right, and so then we can solve for x. We get an x value of 7. And here, we get an x value of negative 2. 7 and negative 2, then, must be the zeros of the polynomial. And you can always check that by plugging them in. If I plug in a 7, 7 squared is 49. 5 times 7 is 35. 49 minus 35 minus 14 is 0. If we plug in negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 5 times negative 2 is 10. 4 plus 10 is 14. Minus 14 is 0. And so you'll always get those to work out. So here I actually will have two x-intercepts on this graph. They're both at 7, and the other one is at negative 2. Okay. All right, so this factoring idea is very important. Notice that the x-intercepts show up as opposite signs in the factored form. Okay, This is going to be very important. In order to find zeros of a polynomial, you set the factors equal to 0 and solve for x. And so in theory, any time you have factors of a polynomial, Anytime you have factors of a polynomial and you set them equal to zero, you're going to find x-intercepts. And vice versa, if you have an x-intercept, you can correspond that to a, to a factor in the polynomial. And so we have a relationship now between these three things. One is uh, the real zeros are going to be the same as the x-intercepts. Uh, and if I give them a name, I'll call them R, then you have an x-intercept that's going to be at R comma zero. So R, we call it R for real. And then the factors, um, we'd say X minus R is a factor. Okay, so these three statements will always be true. As long as, as long as one of them is true, the other two will be true. Okay, so if x minus r is a factor, then r is an x-intercept and a real zero of the polynomial. Okay. There are some other properties which we'll discuss as well. Um, these are the three uh, main ones that are equivalent that we'll be working with. All right, and so if I have a polynomial, let's say, I'll call it p of x, and it's equal to x minus 1 uh, times 2x plus 5. Um, maybe I'll square one of these. There it is. x minus 1 times 2x plus 5 squared. Then what we're going to have uh, for zeros of the polynomial, oh, I don't want x minus, or 2x plus 5. I should have a I should go with something like x plus 5 there. We'll deal with other coefficients in there later. Um, x minus 1, x plus 5 squared. Then the zeros are going to be positive 1 and negative 5. Right? The real zeros are positive 1 because you need to plug in a positive 1 to zero this out and negative 5, because if I plug in a negative 5, I'll zero that out. Okay, it's the numbers that will zero out the factors. Uh, the x-intercepts, then, are going to be uh, 1, 0, and negative 5, 0. So there are two x-intercepts on this um, polynomial as well. Okay. Okay, now an interesting 
feature of this graph is that you have a power of 2 here and a power of 1 on this um, factor. Those exponents actually give us some insight as to the behavior of the graph at those x-intercepts. Um, let me give you a, a more basic example and then we'll generalize it and show you what happens. Remember that when we had an odd power function, like x to an odd power, the graph goes through from negative to positive, or if it was, if it had a negative coefficient, x, a negative x to the odd, you had a graph that goes from positive to negative through the zero, okay, through the x-intercept. Well, if you have an odd power, like 1 or 3, on a factor, then a similar behavior will occur where the x-intercept, where at the x-intercept, the graph goes through the x-axis. Graph goes through. Again, that's because of the odd power on that uh, factor. All right. Now, we've also seen that if you have an even power, there's a different behavior at the x-intercept. If you have x to an even power, the graph doesn't go through the x-intercept, it touches and goes back, it reverses direction, okay? So the graph comes down, touches, and then goes back the other way. And that's because on either side of that x-intercept, you have uh, inputs giving you outputs that are the same sign, right? So positive and negative inputs give you both positive outputs. And if you had a negative x to an even power, then that reverses everything, and again, the graph comes up, touches the x-intercept, and then reverses direction and goes down again, because in that case, all of the outputs are negative, okay, on either side of that um, x-intercept. Well, a similar phenomenon occurs when you have an even power on a factor. At this x-intercept, the graph is actually going to just touch the x-intercept, or touch that point, and then turn and go the other way. All right, so we'd say that the graph touches, oh, I apparently can't spell touches, here we go, so it touches and then turns, okay, okay, so if I were to look at the graph of x minus 1 to the 1 and x plus 5 squared, I now have some very important information. Um, oh, and before I get into that though, we actually have a name for this uh, property. It's the multiplicity of the zero. So the multiplicity of the zero, one, is one. It's an odd multiplicity because it has an odd power. The multiplicity of the zero, negative five, is two. It's an even multiplicity because it has an even power. Okay, so the power on that factor represents the multiplicity of, uh, of the zero. All right, so in this case, the zero, um, let me get rid of some of this here. Well, I'll just say that one has multiplicity one, and negative 5 has multiplicity 2, okay? So here's the 0 along with its multiplicity, which is essentially the power on its factor. And so odd multiplicities result in a uh, the graph going through. So odd makes the graph go through. And even multiplicities make the graph touch. Okay?
So now we'll talk about this function in particular. We've got some important characteristics and we can really identify them just based upon their degree, based upon the sign of the leading coefficient, uh, where the y-intercept is, just a lot of different things. Uh, one interesting way to talk about this is to expand this out. Now, we're not always going to want to expand this out, but it could help us gain an understanding. So if I were to square x plus 5, that gives me x squared plus 10x plus 25. So I have x minus 1 times x squared plus 10x plus 25. And if I distribute then, x times x squared is x cubed, x times 10x is 10x squared, x times 25 is 25x, and then negative 1 times all those terms would be minus x squared, minus 10x, and minus 25. If I combine those like terms, my final polynomial would be x cubed um, plus 9x squared uh, plus 15x minus 25. Okay, so it's a third degree polynomial. Okay, uh, it also has a positive leading coefficient. What's interesting is that if you were to take the product of all of the leading terms along with their multiplicity, you'll get the leading term of the polynomial, right? So x to the 1 times x to the 2 gives me x to the 3. That will always be the case. The leading term to its multiplicity, the leading term raised to its multiplicity, multiply those together, you get the leading term of the polynomial. Also, with the constant, if you take the constant raised to its multiplicity and the constant raised to its multiplicity, you'll get the y-intercept, or the constant in the polynomial. Okay, So we can tell right away off of this, if we just add up the multiplicities, that will give us the degree. Okay. So uh, let's see. I also, I know this is an odd degree, which means the graph is either going to go up to the right or down to the right. right? It's, an, it's a cubic function. Now I'm going to pick the one going up to the right because it's, an, it's a positive leading coefficient, so it must be increasing an increasing graph. So I can eliminate this option here. So I generally know the end behavior of the graph. One arrow, one tail will go down to the left, one will go up to the right. What's interesting though is that there's going to, when you start adding these other terms in, it may do something strange in the middle. You may get some sort of wobble to the graph, okay? And that's where the zeros really come in and the x-intercepts. They determine the, the number of wobbles in the graph. I like using that word, wobbles. Um, and so we can determine that just based upon where the zeros are, or the x-intercepts. And so if I plot these out, negative 5 is over here somewhere. That's an x-intercept. And positive 1, well, we'll put that over here. That's the other x-intercept. And so the graph I know coming through those is going to go down infinitely far and up infinitely far, right? Because I know what the end behavior is going to be. But in between those, there's got to be some turns. Well, the graph is going to go up. We know it goes through the, the x-axis at five, at negative five, right? Oh no, negative five touches. I'm sorry. I got that backwards. It touches at negative five. So it comes up, touches and turns, and then goes up and through at one. Okay. I had that backwards. So the graph should look something like this, all right? Um, you can always verify this on your calculator if you're not sure, um, but that should look like the graph of um, our polynomial here, okay? Now, of course, I don't know exactly how far down this goes. It could go down farther, um, you know, it could be steeper, whatever, but um, I at least know some general characteristics now.
I can also find that y-intercept is going to be at negative 25. Well, I drew that maybe a little close, but honestly, I could just change the scale. So whatever it is, that value right there is at negative 25. So apparently my y-axis scale is quite a bit smaller than the x-axis. Okay. Technically, I probably should have drawn that a little bit, um, a little bit steeper in there uh, if I had tried to get those axes to have the same scale.